Monty, thank you so much for being with me today. It's my pleasure. You seem to study everything. You have biology, <laughs> anthropology, genetics, medicine. How does this all intersect? Well, you know, I've um, never had a singular research focus, and um, my guiding philosophy, honestly, in the lab since mm -hmm. I started, is to work on problems that I and my students find interesting, and to let the students take whatever they develop with them. And so that leads to a very natural turnover of ideas. And so initially, my work was very statistical and computational in nature, and I attracted uh, folks who did that, and they would develop better and better algorithms and take those on, do their own sort of simulation work. Uh, we eventually got very involved in data analysis, and, um, and so we would do these large-scale projects and consortia, and then the students would tend to stay with the consortia, and I'd move on and do something else. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, when we started doing a lot of our own data collection, for example, we, um, we got very interested in dogs. So we worked on dogs for a while, mapping genetic diseases and differences in dogs as part of collaboration. Why with, dogs? Well, because dogs are a phenomenal model system for understanding rapid evolutionary change hmm. and variation in mammalian body plants. So are you eventually kind of hoping to understand humans or just the, the process Both. of evolution? You know, it turns out that uh, for example, dog body size, one of the genes that we identified uh, with Elaine Ostrander and, and others is governed by a gene called uh, IGF-1, okay. insulin growth factor 1, which of course, it's as you know, humans, it's yeah. incredibly <laughs> important in a bunch of different diseases, insulin, uh, IGF-1 signaling uh, from basic um, cell processes all the way through cancer and, and dysregulation. Um, so that's one example where you, know, you can do a phenomenally interesting project in dogs and, and learn some interesting mm. human biology too. Um, and so, you know, the guy who did all the dog work um, uh, wanted to go out and collect village dogs. And so he got a, a grant and did the village dog collections. Mm. And then he started his own lab. And so he took all the samples with him, you know. And so we've really constantly been in this churn which for me, I, I, I think of almost as like the, the secret sauce of the lab, right? Huh. The fact that you know, we attract extraordinarily talented independent postdocs who can then take on their own project. That's how we got into ancient DNA. That's how... Ancient DNA. Oh, yeah, we do a ton of ancient DNA. So that, is that involve exhuming mummies? What does so ancient worked, DNA mean? Um, so we've worked, um, for example, on Utsi the Iceman. Utsi is a 5,000-year-old frozen uh, mummy uh, found on the border of Austria and Italy. And his genome was sequenced, um, partly to identify where he was from, because it was right okay. on the border. And when we sequenced his genome, it turned out his closest living relatives were all Sardinians. Sardinians. Just like, okay, how does that happen, yeah. right? You know, maybe Utsi really was Sardinian and he was on vacation up in the Alps. <laughs> and that's why a they killed him. Holiday break, yeah. Right, exactly, he's on holiday. He actually was murdered. So it's a, it's a forensics case as well, wow. a 5,000-year-old, literally a cold Sounds case. Sounds like a movie, really. It is kind of like a movie. <laughs> um, and so what we wanted to do is go out and... Uh, look at many more ancient samples, but it's very expensive to do because only about 1% of the DNA you get is human. So Meredith Carpenter, a postdoc in my lab, okay. developed a technique so that we could enrich for human DNA and sequence What's lots of What's the rest of, of the DNA? Bacterial. Bacterial, I see, that been, things that are okay. decomposing. All right. And so she developed this technique and we've now got a project with uh, another former postdoc um, on 100 Bulgarian genomes all throughout time that we're trying to sequence. Hmm. Another thing that we developed um, was a depletion strategy where we could almost kind of reverse the process, take human DNA and um, sort of shunt it to okay. sequence what's left. And we want to use this in medical applications hmm. like sequencing human blood to, de um, to detect uh, pathogens, for example, in, in fevers of unknown origin. Okay. Or uh, mucosal swabs. Um, even pneumonias, 50% of pneumonias, we don't know what the bug was. So in other words, if someone has a disease that we don't know what it is, we can take a cell of theirs and find out what's bug and what's person, yep. and then identify exactly. the bug. That's or, fascinating. Or take, yeah, take, you know, take a lung lavage and sequence it and not have 99% of the sequencing be human because that's extraordinarily wow. wasteful. So we have the Iceman to thank for all we this. We got the Iceman. This all comes from the Iceman <laughs> one way or another. Ah, right. Well, Dr. Bismonte, thank you so much for speaking oh, with me today. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you.